My name is Rick Ferry and I'm the president of the John C. Vogel Center for Financial Literacy. We are a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 organization. You can go to vogelcenter.net and that means your tax deductible contributions are greatly appreciated. And uh, today we uh, feature Bob Pizzani as uh, CNBC senior markets correspondent who has covered Wall Street for 25 years. Today he'll be interviewing uh, Dr. Bill Bernstein about his new book, The Delusions of Crowds. And if uh, you missed this or, uh, or can't watch the whole thing, we are recording it and it will be available on Vogelheads.org as well as the Vogel Center site, VogelCenter.net. Uh, within a few days. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. I can't uh, tell you how honored I am to be here. Um, I am uh, markets correspondent, as you heard. I've been with CNBC for 31 years. I've been the markets uh, correspondent since 1997. Uh, I met uh, Jack Bogle in 1997 at that time and uh, in a phone conversation with him and was profoundly influenced by him. Uh, so much so I opened a Vanguard account for my wife in that year, in 1997. And I'm, I'm a, a, a Boglehead, uh, in, uh, in certainly uh, maybe not officially a member. I'd like to be, but uh, I have been for 24 or 25 years. So it's a great honor, and I'm a big fan of Rick Ferry uh, and uh, William Bernstein. Um, we're going to try to keep to the time here. It's a Saturday afternoon. It's beautiful. I spend a lot of your time. We're going to try to keep it to one hour. Um, Bill Bernstein, uh, when I... I've known Jim for many years. So when Jim took this over and said, I'm going to do something with the bold lads, I said, I want in on this. And he said, well, Bill Bernstein's doing anything. I said, I I've known Bill Bernstein's work for years. Um, the, the Birth of Plenty is one of my favorite economics history books. Uh, and I read the new one, The Delusion of Crowds and Why People Go Mad in Groups. And that's what we want to at least start out talking about. I want to remind everyone, if you have a question, you can put it on the right side. I will do my very best to make sure uh, Bill hears about it. Uh, but uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about the delusion of crowds. Obviously, McKay's book, and it's not pronounced McKay, fix that for us, but um, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds covered some of the stuff you covered before, but you felt the need to sort of, I don't know if updated is the right word, but tell us a little bit very briefly about how, what's the genesis of this new book? Why did you feel the need to, to, to look at Extraordinary Popular Delusions again? Well, the um, the genesis of the book was almost 30 years ago when I read Charles Mackay's book. It's Mackay if you're Scotsman, if you're American, Mackay. it's okay to say Mackay. Yeah, if you're American, it's okay to say Mackay. And I read this book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And the original version of this book was written in 1841. And it's a remarkable book because it describes uh, many different mass delusions, religious ones, uh, and also financial ones. And it's most famous for its descriptions of the three great bubbles of the 17th and 18th centuries. The tulip mania, the famous tulip mania, he's the one who actually coined that term uh, and brought it into the English language, as well as the twin bubbles in Paris and London in 1720. And the descriptions are absolutely remarkable of people just going absolutely nuts over stocks or tulips or what, what have you, uh, and how it became a society-wide uh, mania, and then it all crashed down. And at the time that I read this book in the early 1990s, I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, kind of like a B movie about the Roman Empire, not terribly relevant to anything that I was seeing today. And then lo and behold, before my very eyes, several years later, uh, the uh, tech bubble blew and people began behaving in exactly the same way that Mackay uh, described. And I thought to myself, gosh, I've you know seen this movie before and I know just how it ends. Uh, and um, it, uh, it certainly redounded to my, the bottom line of my portfolios. I was able to ignore the, uh, the madness and stay, and stay away. And it turns out that that's not a unique experience. Mackay has been saving people's bacon uh, for the past 150 years. Most famously, uh, Bernard Baruch read the book in 1907, and it uh, saved his bacon back then, and he was so impressed with it that he actually wrote the foreword to the 1932 version of the edition of the book. It's been in print uh, ever since. So, you know, the book really impressed me. And then uh, uh, several years ago, I observed, like all the rest of us, how the uh, Islamic State was able to... Um, to uh, attract 
people from around the world to one of the worst places on the planet to fight and to die. And it turned out that they did that with a, a narrative that was very similar to the one Nakai wrote about uh, in, in his book about the, the Crusades and other religious uh, manias. Uh, and so I thought, you know, the time has come to write a new version of the book, an updated version of the book, and updated with some of the modern science behind it. Now, I have a trigger warning about the book, which is m more than half the book is about religious manias. And if that's not your cup of tea, or if you're particularly a particularly devout follower of one religion or another, you may not want to read the book. But if you're interested, if you're interested in financial manias, you're interested in the in the psychology behind financial and religious manias, then proceed at, uh, at your own pace. Well, I, I read every word of the book, uh, Bill, in preparation for this. And I, I have to say, I, I marveled at your stamina to go through so many hundreds of years of, of religious mania. The Anabaptist chapter was fascinating. It really was something. Um, I want to get to the conclusions here of the book, because even though um, there is some, uh, I understand modern challenges about Mackay's interpretation of how severe uh, the thing was, as you know, there's some modern research that, su that suggests it wasn't as bad, but I don't think that really matters. I, I think there's a whole point to all of this, which is that the way human brains are structured, people tend to keep behaving the same way over and over again. I'm wondering if the core a point about the book, the lesson from the book, which is why humans tend to hurt a bit, why they're so susceptible to manias of all types. Can you give us the conclusion here of what, you, the, the, what the book concludes, essentially? Well, the book is really a meditation on human nature. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we are running around uh, this planet with Stone Age brains, brains that evolved during the, uh, the Stone Age in the space age. So we're, we're navigating a space age world with stone age minds. Uh, and the, the first thing that you have to know about human beings is that first and foremost, we are the ape that imitates. We do what other people around us do. And the question is, why do we, why do, we do that? Uh, and the answer is pretty simple. The best way to think about it uh, is to think about the uh, spread of humankind throughout North America and South America, which took place over a very short period of time, several thousand years from the Bering Strait down to the Tierra del Fuego, maybe at most 10,000 years. And in the process, human beings had to learn how to make kayaks and hunt whales and seals and then hunt bison on the, uh, the Great Plains and then to fashion ploys and blowguns uh, in, uh, in the Amazon. And if you've never done any of those things before, you're never going to figure it out for yourself. Uh, so you have to find the one lucky person uh, or people who, who uh, gradually over time figure out how to do each of those things and then you imitate them. So it turns out that Imitation is an enormously valuable skill to the survival of our species, and it served us very well during the Stone Age. Uh, but in a modern post-industrial society where you have to invest decades in advance, it's not so salutary. Now, the other characteristic is that we are the ape that tells stories. You know, when when Stone Age hunters went out to, to get uh, and hunt a mastodon, uh, they didn't issue each other vectors. Uh, or mathematical descriptions or geometric descriptions. They just, one guy said to the other, hey, you go right, I'll go left, and we'll spear the beast from both sides, okay? We tell stories, in other words. And so we are uniquely susceptible to narratives as opposed to hard facts. So those are the two basic characteristics of why we behave the way we do in the modern capital markets. So narratives are essentially shortcuts uh, to, to understanding the world, is, is that correct? And sometimes they can hijack the more rational center of the brain. There's a the very important point here about narratives that, that you're trying to make. Yeah, narratives, it turns out, are the way that we understand things. And we re respond much more to narratives uh, than, to, than, to, uh, than to dull facts. And I'll give you an example of this, and it's political, but I'm even gonna mention Donald Trump's name, but I think it's pretty neutral which is that late in, 19, in 2015, during one of the Republican uh, nominating uh, debates, uh, the primary debates, uh, somebody asked Ben Carson uh, about, uh, 
uh, about vaccinating his children and whether we should be vaccinating children or not. And he gave a very good scientific answer. He's a neurosurgeon after all. And he said, look, I've seen the data and the data is that it doesn't cause vaccinations don't cause autism. Uh, and, uh, you know, we should vaccinate our, our, our children. Now, you know, he was a good Republican. So he said the government shouldn't force us to do it. It was a pretty good answer. OK, and then Donald Trump broke in uh, and said, uh, you know, I had an employee who had a child, a beautiful child, and she was vaccinated uh, and uh, she got autism. And it's this is turning into an epidemic, I tell you. Every single person, every single political talking head who saw that scored that in Trump's favor. OK, even though, you know, he had gotten the facts completely wrong because he had a better narrative. Uh, than, than Ben Carson did. And that's something we see time and time again in the capital markets. Right. And that uh, narrative, in that case, that narrative appealed to the fear center in your, your brain, whatever, the amygdala, whatever part of your brain that went off. And it so had, it had more relevance than simply stating a dry fact, which is the evidence is that there is no problem with vaccination and autism. Yeah, the, the, message, the message went straight to the amygdala and that pathway is very fast and it overwhelms the pathways to our higher thinking centers Good. Uh, in, in, in the cortex, which are very slow. Right. Let me move on to bubbles. And now let's try to make some conclusions about what bubbles. One, one of the interesting thing about bubbles is they all exhibit certain characteristics in common. Now, you had a very interesting discussion about uh, Minsky, who was a, a fairly obscure economist, as far as I, I can uh, you know, tell, but is sort of now widely so cited for his study of bubbles and bubble conditions. And he noted there were two essential factors. I'm not sure there's just two, but you, you point out in, in, in the book he, that in order to have a bubble, you need to have very cheap money, uh, credit, uh, and you need a revolutionary technology. Can you very briefly discuss that? And, and are there other factors that you know modern scholarship might have identified? They all have something in common. That's my point. And we should all be able to recognize and say, Tulip Mania bubble and you know the dot com bubble actually had something in common, and these are the common characteristics. Yeah, the two driving characteristics of any financial bubble are cheap credit uh, or low interest rates, which is another way of saying that, uh, and and a, and a, and, a, and a, a, a revolutionary technology that captures people's imagination. So, for example, uh, right now you you know what's there to invest in? Uh, you know, you can't put your money into bonds because they have a near zero yield with with, re with any reasonable quality at all. You can't put your money into to traveling. Uh, you know, you can't go to restaurants. Uh, it doesn't do any make any sense to to buy nice clothes as we both demonstrated uh, right now. So you, you put your money into stocks. Well, the stocks of what companies? Well, you pick whatever is the most exciting technology you can find, whether it's you know cryptocurrency uh, or or Tesla or whatever. And so the price gets driven up, and that becomes a self reinforcing phenomenon. The more prices rise, the more money that people make, the more uh, excited they get. And eventually, uh, you know, it reaches a breaking point where where, where it explodes. But, it, uh, you know, you, you can you can tell you can say what's going to happen, but you just can't say when. Yeah, um, there, there's been some other studies that have done that add a few other things besides easy money and disruptive technology. So you, um, I guess financial innovations, I mean, the, so the, the mortgage products that were introduced in the 19. 90s, for example, that helped lead to the financial crisis. Um, um, maybe some other things like supply demand imbalances and things like that. Uh, let me ask you about a very specific bubble right now. I'm going to divert back to the book, but I want to divert and, and, and go right to this point because I've asked, had questions here about Bitcoin. Uh, is Bitcoin a bubble? Is it a, is it a mania? Um, I don't, I, I'm not asking you to pronounce long term what you think of cryptocurrencies. If you want, go ahead. But let me try to make it very immediate right now. Um, give, give us your, your thoughts on what, what, what bit, what's going to happen to Bitcoin. Well, I'll try not to be um, uh, inflammatory. I will not use um, uh, terms like coin apocalypse or coin catastrophe uh, or, 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 or coin tribulation. <laughs> I will simply say that there is a lot of... <laughs> There's a lot of a I lot of when you, lot of, you talk in parentheses, which is great. I don't want to use apocalyptic terms, but let me name them right yeah, now. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, I'm, uh, I'm just I'm, giving you a No, 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 no. I, I deserve that. Um, uh, you know, what, what I will say is that there's a lot of speculation by people who are less than well informed. Uh, and the history 
of of how this falls out is not is not very encouraging. Uh, and that's the whole point of reading the Mackay book is you see you see not only the manias, but you also see uh, how they ended. Now, not all manias end in a bust. Uh, you know, maybe only 80 or 90 percent do. There were, it's been pointed out to me that there were some manias that really didn't result in a in a horrible uh, bust. There are rel some relatively obscure examples. For example, there were three railway manias in England during the 19th, 19th century, and the second one really didn't and you know ended much of a bust but the other if you know nine or ten ones that you can easily name did so yeah it's uh, there's no question in my mind that bitcoin is a mania uh and the question is why do i say that uh because you know they fit mckay's descriptions uh and the mckay description of a mania as well as you know what we all observed during the housing crisis during the housing bubble uh, excuse me, or during the tech bubble of the late 90s were four things. And the first thing that you see is, is that speculation becomes topic A. Uh, when everybody starts talking about a given investment at a party or when they meet casually, that is a bubble, all right? When you see people who are quitting otherwise good jobs to trade assets, thinking they're going to become fabulously rich and you'll never have to work again. That is a bubble. And then there are two other things which are a little uh, not, not as commonly observed, but are still characteristic, which are when skepticism is met with vehemence. I can remember several times during the late 1990s when I expressed skepticism uh, about the tech bubble, being basically told that I was an idiot, uh, if not you know, seeing my, my parentage insulted. Uh, that sort of vehemence you're also seeing with Bitcoin. Uh, as 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 well, people will get very angry at you if you express skepticism. You're 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 an old fogey. You just don't get it. You don't get it. Are um or you just don't get it. Are five words that you hear very very frequently at the top of a a mania. And then finally, it's extreme predictions. You know, Bitcoin's not going to go to a hundred thousand. It'll go to five hundred thousand or a million or ten million. Because don't you know they're not making any more of them? Uh, when you start hearing those sorts of extreme predictions, that's the fourth. Factor, and we're seeing all four of those things right now with with Bitcoin. Yeah, um, uh, I, I agree with your point. I, the only thing I would point out is, as you pointed out in the book, uh, dot com was a bubble that blew up, but the internet lasted. Um, why can't Bitcoin blow up? But blockchain really does last. Doesn't that seem like a lasting technology to you? Oh, what? absolutely. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the central points of the financial section of the book, which is that bubble investors turn out to be uh, capitalism's philanthropists. They wind up losing a lot of money uh, in order to fund these technologies that last. So there's no question that blockchain may turn out to be a very transformational uh, uh, technology in the way we do finance. It's just that the people who are investing uh, in the Bitcoin related yeah. companies probably aren't going to, to benefit. The, the best example of that I had in the, the fiber, world, right? Yeah, it was fiber. WorldCom, right? Yeah, it was, yeah. was WorldCom. I mean, the, 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 the people who invested in WorldCom got taken to the cleaners, but the fiber that WorldCom laid still is something like 20% of today's submarine uh, 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 traffic capability. So WorldCom and, you know, Gary Wittick, the guy who did the company, uh, absolutely uh, savaged his investors, but he was a real benefactor to society and the world at large. Yeah, I agree with your, your point. I, I have no idea whether Bitcoin is worth 5,000 or 50,000. I don't have any idea whether, you know, it's worth somebody spending $69 for a non-fungible token or NFT that just happened. Uh, I used to collect comic books in the 1960s. Somebody just paid, paid 3.25 million for the first Superman action one the other day. Now you might say, what idiot is going to spend 3.25 million for a comic book? But somebody did. So I'm very agnostic on prices. What I am excited about is blockchain is a long-term uh, disruptive technology. I think it's going to last. I would pay very close attention to the Coinbase direct listing this week. That's going to be, um, depending on how that thing prices, that could force another whole new wave of investment in crypto because that thing is so big. Um, we literally don't know what it's worth, 50 billion, 100 billion. It's literally don't know. But I'll give you an idea. If it goes at $50 billion, um, NASDAQ is currently valued at $25 billion. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange, with ICE, with the entire organization around New York Stock Exchange, is $65 billion. 
So essentially, there's an exchange here. It's really an exchange, Coinbase, that is suddenly valued as much as the New York Stock Exchange and all the exchanges that are built around the NYSE. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I don't know if that's signs of a, a bubble or mania, but uh, it's a sign that a lot of people think there's a lot of potential in, in blockchain technology in general. And that's what I think people should pay attention to. Let me just move on. You mentioned uh, the, the, the sort of bubble path, the physiology, uh, diagnostic signs. You had the four Ps that I liked very much, the promoters. So you need somebody out there and talk about the new technology. You need participants, you need buyers. Um, you need to press. Um, you know, one of the things Robert Schiller pointed out in Irrational Exuberance, another book you know, that I got in the first three years going down to the NYSE. Uh, I met Schiller in, uh, when it came out in 2000, I think Irrational Exuberance. I met him just after that. He pointed out that one of the common characteristics of mania was the bubbles first started appearing when the press started appearing in the 1600s. Um, and he was very big, just as you were, pointing out the role of the press in helping uh, promote uh, uh, the, the, these, uh, the, these manias, uh, and politicians, of course, uh, getting involved various ways and either promoting them or changing, uh, changing the law. So, uh, I don't, I don't have a question here, Bill. I just want everyone to realize that what are the characteristics of, of bubble? Well, they need four things, the, the promoters, the participants, uh, the press, um, and, uh, the politicians. Is there anything you want to add to that at all? I'm doing a little learning thing here for the, for everyone who hasn't read the well, yeah, the, what, I, what I do is I have this, you know, medical, I'm a doctor, so I have this medical model of bubbles. So, you know, we already talked about the underlying pathophysiology, which is the Minsky criteria, uh, you know, credit and technology, uh, be it financial or, or technological, to which I add two things, which are uh, amnesia. And then, you know, the, the, and particularly the fourth thing is the amnesia for traditional valuation criteria, which go down the drain. Uh, during a bubble, and then there's the anatomy, and the and, and the, the, there's forced locuses of the anatomy, which you just which you just mentioned. You know, there's the 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 promoters, the participants, the press, uh, and the politicians. And to me, the most fascinating thing in the book uh, that, that I wrote about in the book were these these promoters uh, of of the various uh, schemes involved with the bubble. So starting with John Law with the Mississippi Company bubble. Uh, and then there was a guy in, in, in London named John Blunt, uh, who was a real scoundrel. Uh, and then there was a man by the name of George Hudson, who basically built out a lot of the England's rail network. Uh, and a man named Samuel Insull uh, in the 1920s, who built out the um, electrical utility infrastructure of a large part of the country. And both of these guys, both Hudson and Insull, uh, left us with very valuable infrastructure, uh, enormously valuable infrastructure, but they also became the capitalist heroes of their age uh, and eventually uh, wound up almost going to jail for fraud because of their fraudulent financial uh, dealings. And, and, you know, whenever you see, and the lesson here is that whenever you see somebody lionized in the press as being the capitalist genius of their time, you have to really look out. Okay. We have two very recent examples of that. One of which has already blown up, which is Adam Newman with WeWork, who was this very char char charismatic, uh, guy who, who, who just went completely off the rails in terms of the way he managed WeWork because he was so charismatic and got so little negative feedback, he went completely off the rails. And then, of course, the, 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 the one who's still left standing is Elon Musk, uh, who may wind up as a hero uh, who will you know, transform uh, our, our tra tra transportation technology and other technologies as well. But he's also showing some very worrisome characterological signs that, is, that you often see with these people who, who are the recipients of large amounts of adulation in the press. Yeah, but he may be real. I mean, honestly, the man has revived the space program. I mean, you know, I grew up like you did in the 1960s. I'm a science fiction fan. I grew up with Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov. And, you know, Arthur Clarke wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968. It was about 2001 going to Venus. I mean, you know, there's a, my generation grew up with the whole, where's my jetpack crowd? Like, what happened? Where did the future go? And, I mean, Musk has helped revive the space program. I mean, Thomas Edison was real. He was a real person. He had his own problems. But there was a Thomas Edison who really was a genius. So I agree. Uh, 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 in terms of brain uh, 
characteristics and maybe some uh, mental disorders. He exhibits some characteristics, but um, so far he has remarkably delivered. And, and I'm uh, very close to the SEC and I'm aware of how much agita he's given the SEC. And I, I think he's obviously bented the securities laws uh, with his comments on Twitter, but I think the guy is, is, is brilliant. Um, and, and even if he stopped right now, his contributions would be significant. I don't know about the valuations of his, of Tesla at all. I, I tend to be very agnostic on those things. Uh, but um, I mean, you, you, you do admit genius does exist, right? I'm oh, just... oh, absolutely. And, and I agree with every single thing you said. And I, and I make that point in the book. Uh, you know, uh, George Hudson uh, and and uh, you know George Hudson and Samuel Insel transformed the, the, the England and the United States, respectively, in the way that we live. They were absolute geniuses, uh, but they did not come to good ends because of the hubris that evolved in the course of doing all the wonderful things they did. So the question really is, is does Elon Musk wind up like Samuel Insel, uh, which was not a good ending. Uh, Insel actually wound up dying penniless in Paris. Uh, or does he wind up like Thomas Edison, uh, who will be remembered? I don't. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would not be surprised either way. Or Tesla himself, you know, look what happened to Tesla. He's a brilliant man and really essentially ended up with almost, almost nothing. Um, I want to move on because we've had some specific questions from uh, the listeners and I want to try to uh, address them. We've got a half an hour lesson. Folks, if you got some questions, let me know, but I try to get to a, a couple of them. Uh, some very sp specific questions in, in general about, about investing. I don't know how much you want to, Take them, but I, I want to do something I, I'm very interested in, which is, what are you? What should we be advising people to be doing now? Um, I, I'm obviously a Jack Bogle disciple, and I spend a lot of time ETFs and uh, index investing in general. Um, do you feel, in my view, ETFs and index investing have generally triumphed? Uh, it is widely known now that. Almost all active management is not successful over long periods of time. Not that there isn't, I know Jack would always correct me. It's not that there isn't any. We have very good active investors at Vanguard and that funds, but they're rare and it's hard to find them and they cost too much. So with that said, how do you feel about the progress of, a lack of a better word, the Jack Bogle ideology, the keeping costs low, uh, generally index funds, do you feel that that is winning the day compared to, say, 20 years ago? Very, very slowly. And what I worry about is that the learning curve may be shallower than, than, the, than the birth rate. All right. Uh, I, I see it happening. Uh, and I certainly, you know, certainly you walk into a Bogleheads conference and you think that everybody has got religion uh, and is doing things right. And within the confines of a Bogleheads meeting, yes, that's very true. But when I walk out into the wider world and I talk to people about investing, my sampling shows a very low incidence of Bogleheads. Uh, you know, for every person that I meet that's read Bogle or Rick Ferry or Larry Swedrow, uh, you know, uh, I, I meet, I meet, I meet. 50, 100 who are still listening to their stockbroker. Right. Well, isn't this because literacy in general is not very good? Financial <laughs> isn't very good. I mean, the education system is failing us. I mean, what really disturbs me, I mean, I, I, you know, I belong to the Skeptical Inquirer, uh, you know, and, and group, and you're not taught critical anymore. You're not in, critical thinking in science, critical thinking, inductive reasoning. You're not taught. Why would you even be taught financial literacy? Like, what's the Federal Reserve? What's a stock and what's a bond? It's, it's people come out of high school. It's shocking how little they know. I went in high school. I graduated in '64. I had not a single course on finance. I learned how to type. I learned a little mathematics, uh, trigonometry and geometry, a little science, a little history. But you know, I, I literally didn't know how to balance a checkbook when I was 18. Literally, yeah. I had to learn myself. Yeah. So. Shocking that this happens? Yeah, no, it's not shocking at all. Uh, th th there's that, um, you know, the fact that, that, that America is very good at critical thinking. Of course, you know, Europeans and, and Asians uh, are even more enamored of active investing than we are here in, in this country. There's almost, there's very little of, of an indexing community outside of the United States, maybe, and, and Canada. 
Uh, so, so there's, there's that, but there's a more basic factor involved here, which is how compelling are the narratives? What my book is, is really about aside from disquisition on human nature right. is it's also a, a, um, uh, a, uh, a story of, of, of compelling narratives. Well, right. so why, let, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is a very important point. Why is active management a more compelling narrative than indexing? Oh, well, because it's because indexing is a very, very dull and non-compelling narrative. It's invest in three different index funds, uh, spend 15 minutes a year doing it, and don't even, you know, don't think about it beyond that and go about and live your life. That's a very dull, uncompelling uh, narrative. Uh, the, the, the real narrative is to turn on the financial media and watch Jim Cramer, you know, jump and up, jump up and down on the desk in a gorilla suit and go booyah. Uh, that is what compels people or to hear a corporate executive come and talk about what a great company he has or to hear a listen to a, a, a strategist, a market strategist from a bar, large bank talk about where he thinks the market is going uh, in the next six months. That's much more compelling than buy three funds uh, and rebalance it once a year and and forget about it. It's, it's just that, you know, the Boglehead narrative is so is so dull. Now, where the Boglehead narrative wins, of course, is on the data. But as we've already talked about, narrative always trumps Trump's data. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time with the academic community. Uh, and of course, the academic community has a very dim view of the active management community that called them out. We know the numbers and the data. I cover the SPIVA uh, study. Uh, every, well, they're out twice a year, which is S&P. Um, but that's something I can get on the air. Uh, every year, uh, twice a year. Um, so the academic looks down on the actively management community and the active management community despises the academic community because they call them out on it. They think they're a bunch of eggheads. Um, and uh, the, uh, the academic community also somewhat looks down on financial press um, because they feel, uh, that's us folks, <laughs> that's me, we are uh, too complicit in going along with the active management uh, narrative, uh, which is also uh, you bring up in your book as well. Um, so uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, compelling uh, there's a lot of competing forces that are that are going on here. I, I will tell you, I'm I'm afraid I don't just I, I don't agree with you with your idea that uh, indexing is not winning. I, I I was a proponent of ETFs from 1997 uh, and the time I became and, and I've seen nothing but victory uh, of indexing forces. I know people in the act, I, I'm close to this community, the active management community. They're terrified. They are really worried that indexing is sweeping the world. So I'm, I've agreed everything you said, but I, I really think uh, the Bogleheads are winning um, and the active management community is terrified. And you see it in their responses in the last 10 years, old fogies coming out and saying, oh, wait till this ETS blow up because there's not enough of the underlying stuff out there, it's all going to blow up. It's all a lot of nonsense. It hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Um, saying, uh, oh, this is like communism. Uh, it's like brainless thinking, uh, all nonsense. People know what high costs are. People have under, better understanding. The whole fund community is moving towards e ETFs. They're moving towards lower costs. So I don't, am I crazy, Bill? I mean, did anything I say make any sense there? Don't you? No, 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 no. I, right. I, I, I agree with you. And, and remember, when, when you asked the question initially, I said, yes, the Bogleheads are winning. But what I'm saying is they're winning very, very slowly. It's a glacial uh, process. And it could be that my sampling of people is, is, is skewed in the sense that I'm talking to relatively ordinary uh, people. But when I, you know, just, just my acquaintances, uh, you know, to the extent that anybody who lives in Portland is ordinary, I suppose. Um, but, but what I'm getting at is that what I guess I'm trying to say is that the people who really matter, yes, are the people who are in the HR departments who are, who are picking the funds. They're picking Vanguard funds. It's true. They're picking, you know, uh, low cost index funds. Now, almost anybody in, in any kind of a decent, uh, uh, you know, well, let me, let me phrase it differently. 20 years ago, it was very hard to find a decent 401k plan. Now you look at uh, most 401k plans and most 401k plans have very good low cost choices. Uh, so that, so the battle is being won, I think at that very high level. But when you ask the average person on the street 
uh, about indexing uh, and you ask him about finance, to them, finance is, is, is the guy on the TV uh, yeah. who's picking stocks and, and, uh, and, uh, and it's their broker. It's not, it's not the wisdom yeah. of Jack Bogle. Yeah. Um, the, uh, let me just move on here a bit and talk about the, the three fund portfolio because people ask me all the time what, uh, you know, what, what, what portfolio would I find a compelling and I said, you know, investing should be simple. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, and I always bring up the, the three fund, the Bogle has three fund portfolio book, which is basically some combination of total stock, total bond and international. Um, I'm wondering if you feel that still is a, a valid look. Um, and what I'd love to do um, is uh, I constantly get people who send me 20 portfolios, you know, very impressive. And, and many of them are indexing. They're not like crazy. And uh, they say, what do you think of this? And I say, well, uh, this is very interesting, but I wonder how your 20 fund portfolio would stack up against the, the Bogolet three fund portfolio. And obviously it depends on the mix of the three fund portfolio, but even if you just take, you know, uh, you know, uh, 60, 20, 20, or, or 50, you know, 30, 20, some combination, I wonder, um, and maybe Rick, you can answer this if we ever did anything uh, that stacks up that three fund portfolio against a really comprehensive portfolio. Um, I, my point is, I think you can show simplicity would work. I think that three fund portfolio, and again, it depends how you slice it up, uh, would probably perform as well as anybody's, you know, decent broad portfolio that, that 20 funds in it. You any thoughts about that? Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me, I would say one thing that's really important here, which is it really doesn't matter whether you have a 20 fund portfolio or a three fund portfolio, because in the end, what is far more important than whether you've got, you know, 20 funds sliced and diced all these different ways or three, a simple three fund portfolio. Uh, what matters more is that you stick to whatever your discipline is, stick to whatever your allocation is. Yeah. Uh, that is far more, that is far more important than what your precise allocation is. And that's really what you should be training to do is to have a portfolio that you can stick with through thin and thin. Now, the second thing that I wanna say is that I'm, I'm a big fan of the three fund portfolio and it has done particularly well over the past 15 or 20 years because this has been a particularly bad period for pretty much every other asset class you'd want to look at, whether it's value stocks or small stocks or more of a weight to foreign stocks. Um, if, if you did those things, you're not going to do as well as you would have done with a three fund portfolio. I'm not sure that that's going to be true going forward. But again, uh, that's angels on the head of a pin. What's far more important is that you pick an allocation. Now, there's something that, that in my mind may even be better than a three fund portfolio, and that's a one fund portfolio. OK, if you've got a good target date fund uh, in your 401k, that's really all you need. All right. Uh, and the advantage of a three of a one fund portfolio is because you're not going to see uh, the international or the foreign stock uh, part of that portfolio get horribly creamed. It won't be as visible, even though you own it when you own a target date fund. You're not going to see that in the pricing. You're not going to see that. Yeah. Oh, my God, one of my components lost 55 percent over the, a trailing 15 month period, as, as has happened a couple of times in the past couple of decades. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you one. Vanguard Wellington. If you had a, if I, people ask me all the time, you ever had to one fund, I'd say that's a hard one, but I'd pick Vanguard Wellington myself. I think. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I actually, Wellington is the one non indexed fund that I do recommend happily to people. Yeah. Um, or Wellesley. Or Wellesley. Yeah. Um, just move on. Um, in terms of factors, uh, there's been a lot of debate about what factors matter in Fama French models. Uh, it, it, and I've had a lot of discussion with other uh, people about this. Uh, is there any evidence that you should continue to have a, a value small cap tilt to your portfolio or does that matter uh, at all? It certainly hasn't worked in the last decade, but this, this, I'm just asking generically, does the factor debate matter to you at all? Well, it matters to me because that's how we invest. Uh, we are we are factor loaded, uh, and we're quite happy with our results over the past twenty years. Uh, we were extremely happy with our results 
from you know 2000 to 2010, not so happy with our results in the past 10 years. Uh, over the past 20 years, we're quite happy with, with, with our results. Uh, but that's the hard part. In other words, we do believe that there is a premium to investing certainly in value stocks, maybe even to small stocks, although that's less, less certain. But that, that premium, if there is a premium, doesn't come for free. Your, your, that premium comes at a cost, which is a period like the past 10 years. Now, you know, I'm not going to get into the weeds about whether value stocks have gotten uh, much cheaper than, than growth stocks have. I think that they have, uh, and I continue to believe that. Uh, but, you know, there's, there are no certainties in investing. I could easily be wrong. But if I had to bet one way or the other, I would bet that over the next 10 or 20 years, value stocks will outperform growth stocks. But I have no certainty about yeah. that. Well, if you believe in reversion to the mean, it, that would certainly make some sense. And we've seen that recently uh, with small cap value <laughs> being the out, biggest outperformer this year. I want to hit you on, uh, we've got another 20 minutes left. I want to hit you on uh, uh, six or seven questions to the viewers, the listeners are writing in. Uh, keep the answers relatively short so I can get a number of questions in. Uh, here's one that I think is a good one. Why is it so many institutional investors, endowments and foundations in particular, continue to be such firm believers in alternatives and active management, even though they know or should know the evidence on all of this? Two reasons to be very fast. Number one is they are facing uh, horrible uh, constraints uh, in terms of traditional assets. So if, norm so if everyday plain vanilla stocks and bonds aren't going to enable you to uh, fund your, 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 your participants' uh, liabilities, uh, or your spending, uh, then gosh, we should try something else. And that something else is alternatives. And then the second answer, the second reason is consultants. There's an entire consultant industry out there whose, whose rice bowl is basically shouldering responsibility when things go bad. Uh, so, you, you know, the, the consultant industry is the consultant is the person you blame when things head south. And, you know, a consultant isn't going to have a very good, uh, make a very good living if he recommends a three fund indexed portfolio. Yeah, that's a very good answer. I, I completely agree with that. Uh, let me move on. Uh, the current uh, Bill Miller of the, day, uh, of, of the day is Kathy Wood over at ARK Investing. Um, she has attracted in nine days $500 million to her space ETF, uh, and, and even though she has almost nothing to buy there and she's got here, it's considered a space <laughs> investment. Um, but uh, let me just ask you, any particular thoughts on on, on Kathy Wood is the new current superstar? Well, if you know anything about uh, mutual fund uh, history, she's an easily recognizable type. She's the superstar who makes three or 400% uh, over a couple of year uh, period uh, and then flames out. My favorite was Ryan Jacob, which is an interesting story. Uh, Ryan Jacob ran the internet fund uh, back uh, in the late 90s, and then he ran the switch to the Ryan, uh, the, excuse me, the Jacob, uh, in, the Jacob internet fund, I think it was, after, after that. And that fund posted returns of, I think, 300% one year, 200% the next year, uh, and then proceeded to fall in price by 95% between 2000 and 2002. Now, what's interesting is that fund is still around. And if you string together all of his results, he actually beats the S&P 500. But I don't think there are any sentient uh, beings in this quadrant of the galaxy that actually held on with him for 22 years or 23 years. All right. Uh, and so he's a perfect example. So, you know, do I think that uh, Kathy, Kathy uh, Wood's portfolios are going to crash and burn? Uh, I think it's highly likely because, you know, you could name not just Ryan Jacobs, but Garrett Van Wagoner, uh, uh, Helen Young Hayes, Bill Miller, all people who did very well for a very short, relatively short period of time, except Bill Miller, he did well for 15 years, and then imploded. That's the yeah. history. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, a great point. The first conversation I had ever had with Jack Bogle, that's exactly what he said to me in 1997. And it was about Bill Miller. He said he's a very decent fellow, but you understand how rare they are. So in a sense, I, I don't, I hate bringing up the Somebody's going to be a superstar just by the sheer numbers of people that are out there picking stocks. Somebody's going to hit it right. Um, and so we're going to anoint them as geniuses, even when, um, as the academics would say, it's a statistical probability that someone is going to be, someone's going to be correct. Um, so I always go back and forth between, should, that doesn't, should we ignore anybody that's successful? Um, no, I, I would say you're just a statistical anomaly, therefore you're not important. 
I don't think so, but I, I think you should, people should be very aware of the point that you're making. Let, the way, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me interrupt and just add one fast thing, which is that, you know, if you're, if you're going to run a stock picking, enter a stock picking contest, like the ones that gets done at the high, the ones that get done at the high school level, you don't invest in the S&P 500. You would pick the hairiest, riskiest tech stocks you can find, and you hope that you hit it lucky. That's how you win that contest, yeah. right? And it's the same thing uh, with, with, with superstar fund managers. That's what they do. They have very concentrated portfolios in very hot areas, and that is a recipe in the long term for failure. Yeah. By the way, um, I forgot to ask you, what do you own? I, I know that's, a, I don't want to be personal too much, but people always ask me the question, and I, I'm always amazed how rarely anybody ever asks uh, you know, people in private, you know, what actually do you own? I own about a dozen funds. They're all, all Vanguard funds and almost all index funds. But, you know, I tried paring it down over the years um, and I'm getting better at it. But I don't know what, what generically, what do you own? Well, on the bond side, it's very simple. I own pretty much almost exclusively uh, treasuries with a bit of munis uh, in my in my in my taxable portfolio. And on the stock side, I use Vanguard uh, for you know total stock market or large market uh, in, in in the stock space. And for the uh, for for the small and value tilt, I use Dimensional. Yeah, wonderful organization. I think very highly of, of, of Dimensional. And there's another organization that's transitioning to. Uh, an ETF uh, platform, um, uh, and uh, you know, obviously uh, with uh, Eugene Fama there on the board of Big Thing. Let me get to some more specific questions here. There are actually people actually want your investment uh, advice here. You, you asked Bill about uh, in buying corporate bonds through ETFs. I understand he said not to do that. Is there a specific recommendation? There seems to be a lot of interest in bonds here. Well, um, I, I don't like corporate bonds in general, and this is, I guess, where I, I, I part company with Jack Bogle, because what you're doing is you're getting extra yield, but you're doing it by taking equity-like risk. And I'm a big believer in having a risky part of the portfolio, which is long-term, uh, and then a, 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 a riskless part of the portfolio safe. Uh, you know, if you, if you invested in corporate bonds, for example, in 2008, uh, you had the experience of watching what you thought was a safe asset lose five or 10 or 15% of its capital value. Uh, and that's the money, you know, that's the money you're going to live on when you lose your job. That's the money you're going to use to buy stocks at the fire sale. And it is very discouraging uh, to, to see that head south during a real financial crisis. Um, I'm not overly fond on top of that of ETFs uh, because uh, of the spreads that, that open up. Now you can have this, there's this philosophical argument is what's the real price? Uh, is the real price the, 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 open end uh, fund price at the end of the day or is the real price the ETF price because quite a gap can open up between those two prices. Uh, but there's no question that the open end price functions better. So if you're going to own corporate bonds in a fund, uh, you're probably better off in, a, uh, in an open end fund. An open end fund. Uh Correct. Yeah, not as opposed to an ETF. Yeah. And I'm not a big, as I said, I'm not a big believer in owning corporate bonds anyway. So you, in your personal fund, in your tax account, you own all treasuries? Treasuries and a bit of munis, yeah. Okay. Um, and you don't, it, it, it's not that you don't like corporate bonds. You, like, you don't like corporate bonds in general. Some people don't like bond funds themselves because they, they keep rolling over and having new bonds. And they, there's a lot of people come on are owning individual bonds, whether they're corporate bonds or treasuries or, or, or munis, you're not making that distinction between the, the funds versus owning them individually. You're, you don't like corporate bonds in general. In, in general, but I, and again, you, you've asked another question, which is, you know, what about owning individual corporates versus uh, owning a corporate bond fund? And owning individual corporates is not a game that individual investors should, should play. Those are relatively opaque markets, very high spreads. Uh, leave that to the, to the person uh, at the fund company who knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, some questions on international investing. Um, you know, I remember talking to Jack in 2006. I actually called him and said, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Tell me what you own. And he, he declined to do that. I think, his, I think his son was ran a hedge fund at the time. and He had some money in the hedge fund with his son, but he made it very clear. He, largely, it was total stock and total bond. And I was surprised he didn't seem very big on international investing. I, I, I understand he kind of changed that as time went on. But 
How do you feel about international investing right now as a percentage of the portfolio? Do you, it, where does it fit in? And I'm, if you can give me a percentage, I, maybe that's tying you down too much, but should it be 10 percent, 20 percent? or? or well, here's, here's, here's the way I look at it, which is that very, very roughly, and I haven't looked at it recently, I'll admit, uh, you know, the world stock market is roughly half foreign and half U.S., all right? So efficient markets would tell you that's about what you should be. You should have an equal amount of the two. Now, having said that, there are good reasons to tilt toward the U.S. Uh, number one is, especially in a sheltered account, uh, you get the, uh, you lose the, um, uh, the foreign tax advantage that you have by owning it in a taxable uh, account. So that's, that's number one. Number two, you're going to be spending U.S. dollars in your retirement. Uh, unless you're moving to Europe and you'll be spending euros. So you want to take the currency risk, a little bit of that currency risk out. So you should certainly tilt more heavily towards U.S. stocks. So, you know, if your portfolio is 50-50, uh, there's nothing wrong with being 30-20 or 35-15. In other words, you know, my, my, my set point is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of your stock portfolio being foreign. Do you have any uh, problem with, for example, China, where, you know, viewers, some viewers call in and say, well, Bob, you, you know, you, for every Alibaba that's supposedly privately owned, a very large part of the Chinese stock market uh, it, it is largely, particularly the older school industrial banks, largely controlled by the government. Uh, nominally, they may seem private, but in fact, the government uh, controls them. Um, is th does that figure into your calculation? Uh, does it matter? Does political systems matter uh, even when China is has capitalistic characteristics? Does that where does that fit in the political situation in terms of investing? Well, Chinese equity has a much, much bigger problem than what you just talked about, which is dilution. All right. Uh, and all you have to do is step back and look at things from the Chinese market from 50,000 feet. And what you see is that over the past, I don't know, 28 or 28 years or so that uh, that, that the data has been been kept, uh, the return on Chinese stocks in U.S. dollars has been paltry, a couple of percent at most. And that's, you know, that's only been very recently that it's actually nudged into positive nominal territory with with the results of the past couple of years. And the reason for that is equity dilution. It doesn't do you any good. Good at all if an economy is growing at eight or ten percent a year, if the stock pool is being diluted at twenty percent per year, which is what's happening uh, in in China. Uh, to give you the opposite example, over a very long term, the Swedish market uh, has had about the highest returns over the past one hundred and twenty years of any developed market. Why is that? Because the Swedes don't dilute their stocks, their their stock pool. Okay, so that's a good reason to be wary of emerging markets, and it is a problem with emerging markets index funds, because they are now very heavily weighted uh, towards, towards China. And I might add parenthetically, it's why I prefer DFA's emerging markets funds to Vanguard funds, because they're less exposed to China than the Vanguard fund is. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, a couple more specific questions. We had somebody, um, several people asked about insurance. Um, a couple people asked about long-term care and life insurance policies. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment uh, on that. Yeah feel strongly about that. I had a couple questions on annuities in general. I know annuities have changed in the last you know, 10 years, um, but any thoughts on any of this? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pass on long-term uh, care, care insurance. That is just well beyond uh, my field of expertise. My strategy for, for, for long-term care insurance is to acquire enough assets so that you don't need it. Uh, and, and I have to admit, I don't have a lot of advice to offer to the person who, who, who can't, who can't do that. Um, you know, and then, you know, your second question is annuities. Uh, I have nothing against fixed immediate annuities, the simplest, cheapest possible product, the SPIA, a single premium immediate annuity is a fine product with one caveat, which is don't even think about buying one until you figured out how you're going to uh, delay Social Security until 70, because that is effectively the cheapest annuity and the best annuity that money can buy. Yeah. So rather than maximum Social Security, well, full Social Security is 66 years and four months, right? It depends upon your age, yeah. Yeah. And so if you stay till 70, you 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 get about 30% more, right? I, I, I believe so. Per year. So yeah, somebody... 
at 66 and four months would get $3,000 a month, would get 4,000 a state till 70, I think. Yeah, in other words, in other words if, you, if you take, you know, $100,000 to cover your residual living expenses between the time you're 66 and four months and age 70, okay? That is the same as buying an annuity that not only yields close to 8% or about 8%, but is also an inflation protected annuity, which you can't buy for love or money now anywhere else. Yeah. And of course, it a lot depends on your guessing how long you're going to live. I mean, if you're only going to, if, if you think you're going to die at 73, obviously getting Spouse yeah. and your spouse. Yeah. In other words, it's it's a joint it's a joint problem. So if you're convinced that both you and your sp yeah. spouse are going to be pu pushing up the daisies long before your time, then yes, don't buy, don't do that. No. But for ninety percent of people, it's a good choice. We only have two or three minutes, and I pledged everyone we get out on time. But let me just ask you about the final debate about the sixty forty portfolio, which never made a lot of sense to me particularly, um, and seems to be under assault for the obvious. You know, reason we're all living a lot longer and bonds aren't returning much. But can you give us a, a two minutes on uh, that whole debate, the 60 40 portfolio? Is that even useful to discuss anymore? It's still a thing. Uh, I have nothing wrong. I have no problem with a 60 40 portfolio. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it really depends upon your own personal circumstances and particularly your burn rate. Okay. Uh, if you're 60, if you're retiring at age 60 and you've got a 5% uh, burn rate, uh, a 60-40 portfolio may very well put you in a bad place if you have a bad initial sequence. Uh, on the other hand, if your burn rate is 2 or 3%, it almost doesn't matter what your asset allocation is as long as you have at least a reasonable amount of money in stocks. Yeah, okay. But, 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 but I mean, one thing I might add is that you hear this every five years, the 60-40 portfolio is dead. And I've heard that in one form or another for the past 30 years. It's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Agree. Uh, folks, it is precisely two o'clock. Uh, this has been a wonderful, stimulating. Um, it's a great honor to be with the Vogel Heads. I hope to be back with you again. Um, and uh, Bill, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, I've been a great admirer of your work for many, many years. Um, Rick Ferry is back with us. And Rick, I'm an admirer of your work too. And I really would like, um, I, would, I would get on the air um, a the Boglehead three portfolio, uh, and I'd like to talk to you about it versus a wider portfolio because I think that's a useful way of educating people more about the value of it. Part of the problem is with, with and I think this goes to Bill's point about neuropsychology is people think if I have twenty funds that this a activates my brain, plays the dopamine more than three funds. So it's uh, I think Bill's right. There's nothing wrong with 20 funds, but do you really need it? Well, I don't know, but I feel more like I'm more important or I'm activating my brain cells more if I have 20 funds instead of three funds. And if we can show them, here's your 20 funds since 1999, and here's your three funds since 1999, I think that would go a long way towards telling people, all right, calm down. You don't need, really don't need 20 funds. So maybe you would. Yeah, what, what yeah, what you're talking with the psychologist would call that uh, call 20 fund portfolio no, uh, the illusion of control. Ah, thank you. Okay, maybe we can collaborate and do something on that. Well, thank right. you. And, and thank uh, simplicity you is the uh, greatest genius, doing. correct? Um, take something that's complicated and make it uh, simple. And that's that's a that's a greater yeah. genius than having 20 funds in a portfolio. But <laughs> thank you, Bob and Bill. I mean, that was a fascinating discussion. I mean, everybody agrees that was listening to Guan for a couple more hours. So greatly appreciate both of you being on today. Uh, a wonderful discussion. And, and we hope everyone who joined today enjoyed this presentation. It was recorded and it will be available on Bogleheads.com and on the Boglecenter.net website. Our next Boglehead speaker event will be in May with the guest to be announced soon. So thanks for joining us and see you next time. And thanks, Jim, for hosting this. It went great.